Kim, what's on your radar? Well, you know, I try to bring you news that you don't see much in the mainstream, and this was lightly mentioned yesterday, wasn't heavily covered, so... I want to tell you what Putin said yesterday about the war in Ukraine. Um, you know how the mainstream news just doesn't report much on the Russian perspective of the war. And the reason they do that is because they're afraid you're going to, I guess, hear it and then maybe agree with it. So they seem to do that a lot, right? Um, but, you know, you may agree, you may not agree. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just going to tell you what Putin said so you know about it. Now, yesterday, Putin and Belarusian President Lukashenko met at the Vostochny Cosmodrome in eastern Russia, way over on the other side of Russia, right over by North Korea. Now, why all the way over there? Because yesterday was Cosmonautics Day, the day Russia annually celebrates the first manned mission to space. The two nations' leaders did talk a lot about space, with Putin even saying he's planning to resume his moon exploration missions, despite heavy Western sanctions. So it looks like the space race is back on. Who's excited for this? The Cold War is back and will once again be wasting billions of dollars racing the Russians to the moon. Yay! <laughs> but the meat of the meeting happened when the conversation turned to Ukraine. First things first, Lukashenko blamed the Bucha massacre on the British. Here he is saying, today we discussed in detail their psychological operation which was carried out by the British. If you need addresses, passwords, car numbers, car brands on which they arrived in Bucha and how they did it, FSB of the Russian Federation can provide this information. If not, we could help with that. If Russia had delayed this military operation even a little bit, a crushing blow was being prepared on the territory of Russia on neighboring areas. That was possible. We have clearly seen it today. So the Belarusians say they were the ones to investigate this, and then they turned their findings over to the Russians, which is why they say the Russians can provide this information. And if not, then you can get it from us. So there you have it. I feel like we've now heard everyone point the finger at everyone else for the atrocities in Bucha. Uh, so there it goes. Now, when it comes to negotiations, Putin says they've hit a dead end and that Ukraine has reneged back on the terms that they tentatively agreed to in Istanbul. Kiev has agreed to being a neutral state and giving up NATO ambitions. We've all heard this, but they're also asking for Western nations to give them security guarantees that they say, quote, would be stronger than NATO's Article 5. So I guess technically they wouldn't be in NATO, which is what Russia asked for, but I doubt this is what Russia envisioned in its stead. Kiev is also now taking a hard line on Crimea and the Donbass. Russia wants Crimea to be declared Russian and the Donbass to be declared independent. And in Istanbul, Kiev seemed to give some wiggle room on the topics, but now they've taken them off the table. Even more bothersome to Russia, Kiev is refusing to remove Crimea and the Donbass from the security guarantees that they're asking for. So this is a deal breaker for Russia. Russia currently occupies these territories and fights against Ukraine for them. So if Western NATO nations have a security pact, not NATO, but a, secure, a security pact with Ukraine to defend them against Russia, including in these areas, well, that means war. So, of course, Russia is not going to agree to this. And quite frankly, neither is the West. So now the negotiations are at a stalemate. Now, because the two can't come to an agreement, Putin said, quote, our task is to fulfill and achieve all the goals set, minimizing losses, and we will act rhythmically, calmly, according to the plan originally proposed by the general staff. Putin also denied that there was ever a goal of capturing all of Ukraine or even Kiev. He instead stated, our actions in certain regions of Ukraine were just related to containing enemy forces, destroying military infrastructure, creating conditions for a more active operation in Donbass. And I will mention that there have been several military um, experts that have made the rounds on the mainstream news. And actually, they have also said something similar. You hear a lot of journalists saying, you know, oh, they're backing down from Kiev. Uh, they're, they're no longer, you know, they got pushed out. So this was a, a win or a success for Ukraine. And you'll see these military officers on the TV saying, well, I don't think Russia has really changed their overall goal. They've just shifted where they're putting the troops. So that's just kind of interesting to know. He also addressed how long it's taking to accomplish his goals. He said it's possible to do it faster, but they'd have to ramp up the intensity of hostilities and the intensity of hostilities is related to losses, which they're trying to mitigate. So another big takeaway from the conference was Putin saying the sanctions were not hurting Russia, that they instead are hurting the West. I think we can all see that. He said the West needs to stop the economic war with Russia or there will be serious food shortages. 
Putin also said, though it might sound strange right now, but Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine are like brothers. He said, I have always said that we are the same people, Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. What is happening in Ukraine is a tragedy, no doubt, but as Lukashenko correctly said, they left us no choice. Finally, in the conference, Putin denied the war was going poorly for Russia, and instead he thinks the United States is fighting a proxy war with Russia to the last Ukrainian. And maybe there's something to that. Biden has now called the war in Ukraine a genocide. He did finally say that yesterday. I know the news was kind of trying to bait him into it. So he did. He labeled it one. Now, um, he also is committing another $750 million in military aid. Military aid. That's not humanitarian. $750 in military aid. And today, eight of the top U.S. defense contractors will be meeting with the Department of Defense to talk about what more they can do to beef up Ukraine's ammo. So that is where we're at with this. It looks like, um, I mean, I I think we were all hoping that the peace talks that were going on in Istanbul would actually come to some sort of fruition and we would actually see some peace in Ukraine, that the Russians would be satisfied with whatever negotiation and and back out of the country. But Ukraine, uh, you know, actually Russia has not changed their demands from day one, quite honestly. They've asked for the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and Ukraine is seeming to, you know, decide whether or not they want to do it. So, you know, in, in Istanbul, they kind of said, yeah, OK, we'll start to make some concessions on this. They've said we won't join NATO. Uh, they've said, OK, we can maybe negotiate Crimea, the status of Crimea over a 15 year period. But now, I, I mean, when they say we're not going to join NATO, but we want the exact actually we want bigger, more stronger security um, you know, promises from NATO countries than NATO itself. And then when they say, and we're not willing to even negotiate on Crimea and Donbass, and remember Crimea and Donbass have not been under Ukrainian control for the last eight years. This is something, Crimea has been under Russian control. The people overwhelmingly voted that they want to be with Russia. They have no interest of going back to Ukraine. Um, and the Donbass has been, these are Ukrainians fighting Ukrainians in a civil war for the right. last eight years, wanting their independence. Why is Ukraine still holding on? You know, it it just leads us to a lot of questions on, is there really a desire to end this war or are there other forces wanting to keep this this war going? Yeah, it sounds like the U.S. should say, look, you know, we we were happy to send you uh, weapons when you're being invaded. You need to defend yourselves. But it was in order to reach a peace. And, you know, this deal sounds close to what kind of most people think needs to be the reality, right? No, no NATO for, for Ukraine. And right. realistically, some, you know, the Crimea and then maybe independence for the Donbas and then and the invasion ends. And maybe we should say, look, you can reject that if you want, but you, you cannot continue to count on us, apply, us supplying the weapons and, and uh, putting this amount of pressure on Russia because we don't want to do it to the last. And if that is, if, 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 you're right that if the U.S. government is like, no, 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 we're going to keep keep committing, they that does fit into a last Ukrainian kind of mentality that is so destructive. Yeah, there's been this real presumption that sending arms to Ukraine, funding a war effort, prolonging the war is what's ultimately in the best interest of Ukrainian citizens and what's going to save lives. You hear people you know, flying Ukrainian flags and I think having really sincere sy- sympathies for the Ukrainian people, mm-hmm. really buying into the idea that the way to help them is exclusively through supporting them milit- militarily with the presumption that doing so, I think, is going to result in them winning. And I think that presu- presumption comes from an unwillingness to grapple with the reality that these things, every every war ends through di- diplomacy. The question is how long the fighting persists until then and whether or not the fighting brings it to a, a quicker close or not. And that when you're dealing with a superpower like Russia and there are all of these implications of the West being involved in, you know, Article 5 being triggered and all of these things, it is just really not clear and never has been from the jump that arming Ukraine was going to make this less of a humanitarian crisis for Ukrainians. And I think people got in that orientation in part because they were fundamentally unwilling, and I talked about this on my show, especially in the first few weeks of the crisis, fundamentally unwilling to accept any outcome other than Russia's complete humiliation, right. domination, right. And no concessions right. at, at all on the part of Ukraine. And that just wasn't realistic. But I guess just to just to play you know devil's advocate, just for the sake of uh, putting forth a different view, if 
Uh, Putin, you know, so you just relayed, and I think it's helpful, right, to hear what he's actually saying, but he just said things that I don't think are true. I don't think the British are responsible for the atrocities in Bukha. So if he is willing to lie about what's going on, does that maybe make people rash to say, well, he's not going to keep a deal then? I don't know. How can we trust him to actually abide by this deal if he's just actively misleading his people about right. you know, what's going yeah, on? Well, that's what they well, say about America and NATO expansion. Well, right. and fair enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Sure. I mean, they sure. should at least try. I mean, the fact is the Ukrainians aren't even trying on this. And this is what is it, it is, uh, you, you know, look, do they have the right to defend their country? Absolutely. No one's saying they don't have that right. I've never made that claim that, oh, they don't have the right to do it. Of course, they have the right to do it. The question is, is it, it it's not about, you know, the, the moral, the morality of it. It's about the mm -hmm. realism of it. Right. I, I mean, you're going up against the superpower. They are not putting everything into this. That is very clear. Um, they could hobble Ukraine completely. I mean, they could level if I mean, they could nuke the country if they wanted to, and they're not going that far, thank goodness, at this point. Um, but you know, I think the question of what is winning, you know, what is what does winning mm. look like? Does that look like leveled cities and thousands of civilians dead? I mean, what is what what outcome is winning for Ukraine? Uh, and, and I think what people have in their mind is, well, the the outcome of winning would be. Russia doesn't take Ukraine, but Russia never, ever has said they were going to take Ukraine. That was a wet, that was something that got spun in Western media. I was watching even MSNBC. I mean, even even there, they brought in a military expert, you know, somebody's in the military, and he even said he's like, when they were saying, you know, now it looks like Russia's no longer going to be taking Ukraine. Like, what do you think of this? And he's like, well, no, that was never, you know, even even their own experts are saying, well, that was never even really the 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 plan. So. Yes, of course, that would be a win for Ukraine. I guess we could we could say they're not going to take your country. That's a good thing. Of course, Ukraine should have their independence. I don't think anyone really, if you look through the history of that country, disputes that they should have their independence. But at what cost, you know, do you hold on mm -hmm. to Donbass and Crimea, two areas that don't even mm -hmm. really want to be with Ukraine? At what cost? And the thing is, Robbie, to your point, yes, of course. The, the U.S. should say, we're not going to be funding you anymore. We're not going to send you weapons. You know, you need to have a good faith negotiation. But guess what? They're not. And it makes me question if behind the scenes we're egging them on. And it is what Russia is saying, that we are egging them on and, and getting them to and goading them to fight to the last Ukrainian because we're instead having now milit now the top eight military industrial complex guys are showing up at the Department of Defense and they're going to talk about what more they can do to, to weaponize Ukraine. And now this talk, they're not going to be talking about just defense weapons. You know, now they're moving on to maybe some offensive weapons as well that's going to be in the discussion. Whether or not they do it is another question. But, you know, we're not backing down on this. We're saying let's let's keep amping them up. Let's keep giving them more. It's a proxy war. We know how those ends. It's And it's devastating. And, I, you know, many of us would like to not see that happen to the Ukrainian people or anywhere else in the world for that matter. All right, thank so you, we'll Kim. See. We'll be back with more Rising after this.